When you and I say that we know the New Testament, what most of us usually mean by that is that we know the Gospels in the New Testament. But the New Testament is a book with two major parts or two major divisions. The first part of the Gospels really is Jesus' ministry, and the second part includes letters and epistles to saints who embrace that divinity. And nobody has a bigger influence on the second half of the New Testament and thus on Christianity's interpretation of Jesus than a man named Paul. Who is Paul and why does he matter so much? Why is he such a major part of the New Testament? I remember my early seminary teaching days, there was this classic church video that was done called Paul, a Chosen Vessel. And there's this scene of Paul testifying of his conversion before Festus and King Agrippa. And, well, it was gripping. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee to make thee a minister. There's just so much to learn, to love, to question, and even to debate about Paul. And BYU Ancient Scripture professor Nick Frederick has recently published a really insightful chapter article on the life of the Apostle Paul, who he is, and why he matters so much. Paul's the first one to put out written documents, at least that we have, trying to explore the the implications of Jesus' life and ministry and atonement and death. I mean, he is the guy. He's the first one to step back and ask questions like, you know, what does this all mean? Who is Jesus? How can he be God? How does salvation work? What is this church, this new movement in relationship to Judaism? And so if, if you want to talk about, you know, Christian origins, where Christian doctrine and theology comes from, well, you know, you have to go back to Paul. We should probably make an, an honest effort to understand who this guy is. On today's episode of Why Religion, get ready to learn things about the Apostle Paul, or maybe should we still call him Saul, that you maybe have never known, and to understand why this great missionary still matters so much today. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why this study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion. Research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp sat down with his ancient scripture colleague, Professor Nick Frederick, to interview him about his chapter called The Life of the Apostle Paul, an Overview. It was published in the book New Testament History, Culture, and Society, a background of the texts of the New Testament. Part one will cover Paul's early life and education, Paul's humanity, his persecution of Christianity, and his conversion to it. In part two, we'll get a little bit more into why Paul matters today and what saints can learn about him, particularly in relation to being better ministers and missionaries. And in part three, Professor Frederick will tell us a little bit about his own academic background and why he chooses to be a person of faith. So here is Ryan Sharp interviewing his colleague, Nick Frederick, on the Apostle Paul. So the chapter that we're going to talk about today is a chapter that Dr. Frederick wrote in Uh, Lincoln Blumel's edited volume entitled New Testament, History, Culture, and Society. And the chapter uh, that was done is called The Life of the Apostle Paul, an Overview. Now, what you've done is really synthesized a a lot of information about Paul, about his life, his ministry, context, um, some some framework for the epistles that are written. Uh, I want to now kind of lead in with a quote from from the book and then ask a couple of questions about that. Uh, In in the article you said, Paul continues to be the topic of much debate in the modern era, uh, with books describing Paul as everything from quote, the real founder of Christianity to a Jewish cultural critic. 
While it may be close to impossible to retrieve the uh, historical Paul from the pages of the New Testament, this chapter will attempt to construct a brief biographical overview of Paul and his life, synthesizing information from the book of Acts and from Paul's own letters, while also remaining cognizant that there are several places where New Testament sources are reticent or in disagreement. Obviously, you've had a lot of interest in in Paul and his letters. You've taught several semesters worth of classes here at BYU on that. Is there anything else, anything else about Paul that has piqued your interest and made him uh, a significant um, topic of study, person to study for you? Um, well, there's a couple ways I could answer that, I guess. I, I, I find Paul fascinating because we have letters written by him, right, in the New Testament. We, we can actually look at a text and we have someone describing how they react to something, how they feel about something. Um, we get Paul's emotions that come through in his letters. He's angry, he's sad, he cries, he yells, he swears, he makes dirty jokes on one occasion in Galatians. You know, he, he, he's, he's absolutely human, and there, there's, there's a benefit in reading the Bible and finding the humanity, right? Finding someone I can say, hey, I can connect with that guy. That guy goes through the same struggles that I do, right? I read Nephi, I don't get Nephi, right? Nephi is, he is so far above me, I can't really relate to what Nephi goes through. But Paul, that's when I can look at and say, yeah, I could hang out with that guy. He probably, he might yell at me from time to time, right? But it's somebody I could relate to. But I to. yell at you from yeah, time exactly. to time too, it'd, it'd, so, it'd, be no diff- it'd be no different yeah. than having Ryan <laughs> hanging out with me at lunch. So, I mean, th- there's something really approachable yeah. about Paul. And like I said, in the Bible where, or in the Book of Mormon where so many people don't feel approachable, Paul feels approachable. And yeah. I, I, I appreciate that about him. No, that's a great thought. Thank you. Uh, I think most of us, and, and probably most of our listeners, have sat in a lesson when the teacher made some version of the comment that before the experience on the road to Damascus, he was known as Saul, but after his conversion, his name was changed to Paul. Uh, spend a, a minute clarifying that for our listeners. You talk about it a little bit in this, uh, in this chapter. The issue with with Paul's name, right, is a complicated one. Um, He always refers to himself as Paul in his letters. Luke is the one who refers to him as Saul up until we get the first Gentile mission. In Acts 13, all of a sudden, he changes it to Paul. And so we kind of have this, um, and and perhaps that's a nice place to insert that one of the issues dealing with Paul is there are some things that only Luke tells us, and there are some things that only Paul tells us, and so, right, how do we kind of synthesize those out? Um, for example, Luke is the only one who talks about Paul being a Roman citizen. Paul never brings that up, right? So it's just complicated kind of trying to take these different sources. You've got these 14 letters. You've got this history written by Luke. Okay, how do they fit together? Now, let me, let me pause you just a second for our listeners to make sure that it's clear. When you say Luke, you're talking about Luke writing in the book of Acts. I'm talking about Luke writing the book of Acts, okay. right? And so Luke's companion of Paul. He writes this early history of the Christian church. And he tells us some stuff about Paul that Paul never says about himself, right? And so it's, it's just it's it's one of the things when you investigate into the life of Paul is how much do you take from Luke, how much do you take from what Paul says, what if they're in disagreement, right? Which source to go with? And so the name thing kind of falls into that category. And and so I was taught in seminary growing up that you know he was Saul when he was this mean, vicious Jew, and then when he converted to the loving, peaceful Christian faith. He changed his name to Paul as a way of cutting ties with his past and things like that. And that's that's simply not the case. I think we do a disservice to Paul when we say that. Um, his Hebrew name was Saul. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, and he's named after the only king, likely, right? Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament, the only king from the tribe of Benjamin. And so that would have been a name I think he would have been proud of. Um, and so when he hangs out with his Jewish friends, right, he goes by Saul. Paul, on the other hand, is a Latin name. Um, and so when Paul is out with the Gentiles, right, you could say that perhaps he goes by Paul at that case, at, at that point. Um, so Gentile named Paul, Jewish named Saul. There's not this moment of the conversion where he picks one over the other. It just seems to be in Acts 13, going out to the Gentile mission. Luke says, okay, let's start calling him Paul. And, and to be fair, Paul is not an overly complimentary name. Um, it means short or stubby, right? And so it's not like he would pick that as a, Paul would necessarily pick that as his preferred name. It is fitting in 2 Corinthians you know, 10, uh, one of the complaints against Paul is that he writes these very weighty, powerful letters, but you meet him in person and he's underwhelming. He's kind of a short, scrawny guy with a whiny voice. 
And so perhaps that's a nickname that he picked up somewhere along the way that is fitting. I tell my students sometimes, if, when you encounter Paul in the, in the Celestial Kingdom, he may actually prefer you to call him Saul. Like I said, there's a lot of history in being named after the, the, the only king from your tribe, right? It's a nice name. Yeah, very good. And, and this is uh, from that section of your chapter talking about the early life of Paul. And, and I want to get there, uh, but before we do, let me ask a, a quick question of that description of Paul's short, whiny voice, etc. cetera, uh, seems to match the description that's attributed to Joseph Smith. Any comment uh, from you on, on that statement from Joseph Smith speaking about Paul? Uh, no, it, again, it seems very uh, very accurate. When you read Paul's letters, it does seem like he's picked on a lot for being short, uh, for having a whiny voice, and jo- and Joseph, when he describes it, kind of lists those same characteristics, right? That Paul is just not that physically imposing. And in the ancient world where your physical presence was highly prized, right, you wanted to be taught by somebody who was tall and spoke with a commanding voice, and you know you, you would follow that kind of individual. And so, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians, you know, it seems like there's some rivalry between Paul and this guy named Apollos, who is this tall and handsome, charismatic fellow, and the Corinthians are going after him, they're leaving Paul behind, and, and Paul says he writes a letter with many tears as kind of a result of the way he's been treated by the Corinthians, right? He feels like they've just kind of abandoned him because he doesn't look as impressive as, you know, they think he should. And so he, he does kind of have this this chip on his shoulder, and it probably serves him well, right, that he doesn't have the physical appearance that the ancient world kind of demands that he would have. So I, I think it's right on point, right, that Joseph would describe him the way that he does. Yeah, very good. Thank you. In in this same section on the early life of Paul, uh, this is one of your longer sections. Maybe what are three or four of the most important things that you think we should understand about Paul's early life and education? Yeah, this is hard because this is where we have to do most of our sleuthing when it comes to to Paul, because he doesn't really talk about himself a whole lot in his letters, and Luke doesn't pick up the story with Paul until we get to the persecution of Stephen. Um, and so it's, it's hard to know exactly what to do with the early life of Paul. Um, here's what we can say. Uh, he's born in Tarsus, right, up in Asia Minor, really important city. Um, there would be a lot of different cultural steam, streams coming through Tarsus. Uh, he's raised by parents who were Jews and who appear to be Roman citizens, which was highly prized in the ancient world. Um, we don't know. I mean, one of the big debates about Paul is where did his his own Roman citizenship come from that Luke talks about so much. Uh, there's multiple ways you can get Roman citizenship. You can purchase it. Uh, you could be granted it for meritorious service to Rome. Manumitted slaves of Roman citizens were given Roman citizenship. It's likely that Paul's parents probably fell into that the latter of those two. They were either manumitted slaves or they'd been granted it for meritorious service to Rome or something like that. And so Paul's raised as a Roman citizen. He's raised in a Gentile city, and but he's raised religiously as a Jew. And so he's a citizen of three worlds, right? Religiously, he's a Jew. Culturally, he's a Greek. Politically, he's a Roman. And this is probably the the traits that allow him to be the missionary he's going to be, right? There's nowhere he can go in the world and not fit in. He's the perfect chameleon as a result of this. At some point early on in his life, um, depending upon how you interpret a participle from um, Galatians, he moves to Jerusalem when he's five or six, or he moves there in his early teens, uh, probably studies with an influential rabbi named uh, Gamaliel, and kind of seems to be leaning towards the Pharisaic lifestyle. It seems like he is, that's the kind of school that attracts him, is those who are, as he says, zealous for the traditions of my father, is how he describes it later on. And so he seems to be kind of headed in that direction. Um, He calls himself a Pharisee, even long after, I mean, towards the end of his life, he still refers to himself as a Pharisee, right? He embraces that lifestyle. What what would he mean by that, by the way? If he says that he refers to himself as a Pharisee, what's he implying? Um, Hang on to that when we talk about conversion. Yep. That might be easier to discuss with conversion. Um, It's likely that Paul was married. Um, It would be unusual for a Jewish male in the first century to not be married, usually between 18 and 20. Jewish males are married. Some put it off till later. But Paul always gives the impression that he follows the cultural norms of the day. Um, We have no idea what happened to his wife, if he had children, right? It's possible they died uh, 
some epidemic. It's possible they were divorced when he chose to follow Jesus or something like that. Um, we have one vague possibility. There's a verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, where Paul refers to his true yoke fellow. One second century Christian scholar, Clement of Alexandria, claimed that that was a reference to Paul's wife, that she was a, a member of the church in Philippi. So some people have thought maybe Lydia was Paul's wife. Uh, there's a great article written in BYU Studies a few years ago by two BYU professors, one arguing that was talking about Paul's wife, one arguing that it wasn't. Right, That's a debatable topic. Um, but again, he, he doesn't ever say anything about his marital state other than in 1 Corinthians 7 when he says he currently isn't married. But I find it very probable that he was at one point. Um, as far as a trade goes, he call, uh, Luke at least calls him a skenopoios, right, in, in Acts, which is a tent maker. And so it seems like it's probable that his parents worked with leather, right, whether that's making tents, uh, sales for ships, repairing clothing, things like that. Paul seems to have adapted that same trade, so that would be a way of, of making money, right? It's just working with leather. It's always in demand, good chance to socialize with people. Um, we, had, we know he had one sister who lives in Jerusalem because it's her son, a nephew of Paul's, that alerts him to a conspiracy later on. But other than that, we can't say anything else about um, the, the makeup of his family. Mm -hmm. But he is, he is a guy who is... Who is Hardcore, died in the wool, devoted, zealous Jew by the time we reach Acts chapter 6. Yeah, very good. That's helpful. One of the questions that members often have is they think about Paul and read about Paul, particularly when we get into uh, the stoning of Stephen, is what, what exactly is Paul's role in persecuting the church? In your article, you provide some interesting textual insights into this question, uh, from your personal studies and the research you've done, how would you answer uh, these questions about Paul's role in persecuting the church? Uh, he definitely has a role. I mean, it's one he he seems to embrace uh, quite you know, zealously. Um, was he on the front lines of this? Was it a, was he the one leading it? Uh, that's hard to say, but it does seem like he felt a responsibility as a zealous, devout, faithful Jew, recognizing that there was a problem within Judaism. There was this upstart sect of Judaism, these messianists who are following Jesus, that, that are causing issues, right? Um, Paul seems to have viewed them as very problematic, um, as, I don't know, Judaism is, is something of an insular faith, right? They, they have markers that set them off from everyone around them. Judaism is supposed to stay, stay, to stay separate. And so circumcision, um, purity regulations, dietary restrictions, Sabbath observance, these are things that are supposed to keep you separate from the world. And I think Paul views this messianist upstart movement and by the way, they're initially called followers of the way, right? They're not called Christianoi until later on in Antioch. And so initially, those who follow Jesus just call themselves followers of the way. We don't know what that means. Is it the right way? Is it a different way? Is it Jesus is the way? We don't know. But Paul seems to view them as a threat to kind of this, the status of Judaism. Maybe it's because of the way they're evangelizing. Maybe it's because of the way Peter's interpreting scriptures in Acts chapter 2. And they're, you know, it looks like they're going to kind of break these boundaries of Judaism and reach out to the Gentiles or something. And that puts Israel's status as God's covenant people in jeopardy. I mean, Paul's not doing this because he just hates Christians. He's doing this because he is zealous for the traditions of his fathers. I mean, it's very much like the story of Phineas in the Old Testament, right? When a Midianite woman is brought inside the camp of Israel by an Israelite male, and Phineas picks up a spear and takes them both out. And he's applauded for that, because that's what a good Jew does when those boundary lines are threatened, and that's, that's what Paul does as a zealous Jew. Um, is it possible that he physically beat people? I think absolutely. Is it possible he murdered people? That's, I don't know, he leaves the door open for that, okay, as, as a possibility as well. But it's very clear that he views them as a threat. And, and in his mind, he's doing the work of the Lord. Yeah, I, right? I think I, absolutely. I don't think there's any other way to look at it than he feels like this is what God has asked him to do. Yeah, and and so with that, I, I thought there was a, this was a fascinating part of the of your chapter. Uh, when we think of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, uh, 
we're accustomed to referring to it as his conversion to Christianity. Maybe spend just a minute summarizing his experience and then explain why you push back a little bit on that description. Um, so, okay, so Acts chapter, where we first meet Paul is Acts chapter 6, right? Uh, Stephen is preaching in the synagogue. There's a reference to the, the freedmen from Cilicia, right? Which is very, Paul's from Cilicia. That's where Tarsus is. That's probably Paul's first introduction. Then we have this stoning of Stephen in chapter 7. Uh, then chapter 8, Paul of obtains kind of authority from the the high priest, right, to take letters, documents to Damascus and ferret out some more of these Christians. Um, and it, I, I, it's very likely that he has no actual authority. He definitely doesn't have Roman authority. This is a religious concern. The Romans wouldn't care. What can the high priest of Jerusalem do to a synagogue in Antioch? It's hard to say. It's probably more the threat of excommunication, right? You come with me or face excommunication. And so Paul's going to go to Antioch and try to track down some of these kind of messiness, these followers of Jesus. So he's on the road to Damascus. Uh, he encounters Jesus, right? And, and it's interesting that it's not like Paul is praying. It's not like Paul is asked for confirmation, am I doing something right or wrong, right? Jesus just appears and says, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul's response, I, I wasn't aware that I was. I didn't know that I was. And so, you know, you, 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 you have Paul then having this experience. He goes on to Damascus. He's healed, things like that, and moves on from there. But the question is, what exactly happens to Paul? As Latter-day Saints, we talk about conversion a lot, and we tend to talk about conversion, meaning somebody goes from one faith to another. So they're they're a Catholic, they're baptized into the LDS faith. They've converted to, you know, a Latter-day Saint religion. And so people tend to talk about Paul as, well, he's converted from Judaism to Christianity, the same way that we would talk about someone becoming Catholic, or going from Catholicism to a Latter-day Saint faith. And I don't think that's the case at all. Um, that suggests that, I mean, to think that way suggests that the boundary lines between Judaism and Christianity are black and white. It's more likely that, again, Christians are just seen as Jewish messianists. They're another political party like Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and kind of like the Samaritans who are out there on the fringe. They're just another form of practicing Judaism. And so what is Paul actually saying when he begins to follow Jesus? I went from following the Pharisee way of doing things to the messianist way of doing things. But in his mind, he's still the Jew. Right? I mean, when he calls himself a Pharisee decades later, it's because in his mind he's still a Jew. There, he hasn't renounced Judaism to become Christian. It's just a different expression of his Jewish faith. Yeah, and again, in all of these, following the Lord and, and seeking to do his work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, during my short time teaching uh, here in the, the Department of Ancient Scripture, I've noticed readers of Scripture often fall prey to the temptation of interpreting previous events and writings using a modern-day lens, sometimes called presentism. When we think about these in, in your uh, article, you call them the missing years, uh, we may be tempted to assume that the organization of the church functioned exactly the same then as it does now. Using this lens, we might assume after this experience that you described, Paul's first course of action is, okay, well, now I'm going to go see Peter, and and there's going to be a formal organization there, and presumably he's going to be ordained as an apostle because he calls himself an apostle. Um, in your article, you provide important insights into his movements, into Paul's movements after his experience with the Savior, and specifically how he likely understood the term apostle. So first, maybe comment on the title of apostle, and then walk us through Paul's movements between his conversion and his, uh, his quote-unquote conversion and his first mission. Yeah, so as far as the title apostle goes, right, that means something very specific for us as Latter-day Saints. Uh, but the word in Greek simply apostello, right? One who is sent forth is what the term means. So a generic term possibly for a missionary. Um, so when Paul says... I'm an apostle, right? I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. What is he actually saying? Is he, is he saying that I was selected to a uh, unique quorum of 12 individuals? I don't think so. Um, Luke tells us in chapter, in chapter 14, that's where he's called an apostle for the first time. But it's not the 12 who set him apart, right? It's the elders in Antioch who set him apart as an apostle. And so again, that seems very much like it's a missionary-type position, 
In Acts chapter 1, when they give the qualifications for what is an apostle, Paul doesn't fit those. He hasn't been with the ministry of Jesus since its very beginning, since the baptism and through the resurrection. Paul's a latecomer to this. And so my, my guess is when Paul says, such as in Galatians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not of man, not called by men, but of God, right? He's, he's saying, I was commissioned by Jesus Christ himself to take the gospel to the Gentiles, right? I don't see the term apostle there being used to refer to what we would consider an apostle today. And, you know, part of the issue is, you know, Romans chapter 16, you have a woman named Junia who's called an apostle. Well, I mean, that raises complications in and of itself, right? So it seems like apostle is more or less just those who've been commissioned to take the gospel to the world. Does that mean that Paul never was brought in as a member of this organization that we would call the Corner of the Twelve? I'm not saying that either, right? It's very possible that he was. But just because the name, the title apostle pops up in a letter like Galatians or in a place like Acts, we shouldn't jump to assume he's joined the Quorum of the Twelve, right? Because he doesn't even connect with Peter for several years, right? Yeah, yeah, and this is interesting. Um, I guess I, I should I give a little bit of what we can say as far as dating goes. We don't know when Paul is born, right? I didn't mention this earlier, but I'll mention it now. Anywhere in the first decade, right, after Jesus, so if like 0 to 10 AD, right, or if you assume Jesus is born in 5 or 6 BC, then 5 or 6 AD, right, could be where where Paul comes in, and so he's probably somewhere in his 30s or late 20s when Jesus is crucified, right? Probably a little bit older. I mean, Luke calls him a neonios, which is anywhere from 24 to 40, okay? So who knows how old this guy is, right? And so young man, middle-aged, hard to say. So after the, his kind of experience on the road to Damascus, you would expect him to go to Jerusalem, right? You'd expect him to kind of be in contact with the church. But again, he's probably somebody in his I don't know, mid-30s by this point, okay? If not, perhaps even older. And so there's an independent streak, I think, that you see emerge here with Paul. And so he instead goes to, he goes to Damascus, right? He's healed there. Then he goes to Arabia, nearby Nabatea for a while, and stays there for a couple years. And then he has to flee there because he gets in trouble, goes back to Damascus, where he's still in trouble. He stays there for a while, but he's still in trouble. And where he tells us, or Luke tells us, he has to be led over the wall in a basket to get away, right? Because he's, he's angered uh, the local administration. And this is a three-year period, right, where he hasn't, as far as we know, had any contact with the leadership of the church. Okay? He's out there doing missionary work. He's out there doing what he thinks he's been called to do. And again, we, we only get this through bits and pieces of, you know, a verse here in Galatians, a verse in Acts, right, trying to reconstruct this. After three years, after he, he leaves Damascus, and by the way, that Damascus experience is so um, troubling for Paul that in 2 Corinthians 11, when he goes through kind of a list of the bad things that have happened to him, he says, the worst, most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me was that time I had to be led over the city in a basket, right? And this is decades later, and that's still fresh in his mind. Paul's not the kind of guy who runs away from a fight, right? And that really seems to have stuck with him. It's at that point, three years later, after Damascus, that he, he meets with Peter, and he stays with him for a couple weeks, probably talking about what it was like to have served with Jesus, kind of the things that have happened. But Paul makes a point of saying, I just met with Peter, right? Then a little bit later, you know, John and James, right? The pillars of the church. But he, he seems to try really hard to say, I didn't get my stuff from them. I didn't get my authority from them. The stuff I teach, I didn't get from them, right? I got that from Jesus. I was commissioned of Jesus Christ. And there's always a little tension, it seems, in, in Paul's letters, especially early on, between what he's doing and what he perceives kind of the 12 doing at Jerusalem. In Galatians, he says, you know, Peter has his calling. The 12, they, 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 they go to the Jews. Me, I go to the Gentiles. And they have their sphere, and I have my sphere. And that's kind of how he sees it. He doesn't necessarily see himself as working under the, the leadership in Jerusalem. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out.
They have just published a brand new book called Raising the Standard of Truth to supplement your 2021 Come Follow Me study of the Doctrine and Covenants and church history. This book features essays from scholars at Brigham Young University, the Church History Department, and the Joseph Smith Papers that explore events and teachings of the early years of the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Chapters cover great topics such as Joseph Smith's accounts of the First Vision, the translation and coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the restoration of priesthood power, doctrinal teachings about consecration, Zion, the kingdoms of glory, and work for the dead are also looked into, as well as the harrowing experiences in Liberty and Carthage jails and the exodus of the Latter-day Saints to the West. You'll find great insights about the Doctrine and Covenants and church history from many of these great scholars. Again, the book is called Raising the Standard of Truth. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Professor Nick Frederick discuss his published chapter on the life of Paul. We've arrived at part two of this episode where Professor Frederick will tell us a little bit more about Paul's death and then move into some application about what we can learn from Paul about being better ministers and missionaries. So here is Ryan Sharp continuing his interview with Dr. Nick Frederick. So from both your personal research on Paul and your experience teaching the second half of the New Testament, uh, what would you hope readers would understand when they approach the missionary stories in the book of Acts and the epistles of Paul? I realize that's a massive question, but you can take it whichever direction you want. What would I hope they understand? Um, I'd hope they understand how important Paul is to again, to, to our faith as Latter-day Saints. Um, I, I hope they understand that if, if we want to reach out to other Christians, we need to be able to speak their language, and their language is the letters of Paul. It's Romans, it's Galatians, it's 1 Corinthians. That's how they process uh, the Christian faith. And if we can't speak that language, we're going to really struggle to connect with them. I, I think one of the best classes, at least at BYU, one of the best missionary prep classes you can take is to take a class on Paul so that you understand who this guy is and why his letters mean what they do, the, the doctrine that he puts out. You know, can, can you talk about Ephesians to, you know, to an evangelical Christian? Can you talk about the ideas there? Because that's how they're going to be thinking, right? Can, can you build that, that common ground? Paul is so important from that, from that respect. If we really want to convert you know, the world... A large part of that starts with us coming to a better understanding of, of who Paul is and what these letters are uh, that he writes. And uh, another thing that I would, on a more kind of our own kind of personal level, there's a lot of talk in the church, you know, about things like ministering, right? About being a disciple, about being on the covenant path. And Paul really is that example of what ministering looks like. Everything he does is to build the kingdom. It's to bring people to a testimony of Jesus Christ. He puts himself on the line again and again and again um, to, to, to demonstrate to them what value discipleship has, um, encouraging them to, to, to love each other, to help each other, support each other. He has this thing called the collection where he goes around and he gathers money from his Gentile churches, so we can take it back to help the church in Jerusalem, right? I mean, everything he's doing is to build a kingdom. I think he's the definition of what a ministering disciple, someone who stays on the covenant path, looks like. If, if we're looking for someone to emulate, man, Paul really is a fantastic example of what a disciple of Christ should be. And referring to that line in Second Timothy, uh, you start moving to conclusion in your chapter here where you have this great phrase, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. And then you said, in other words, Paul has wrestled a good match, he's run a good race, and he has maintained through it all his loyalty to and confidence in Jesus Christ. Um, I want to now read the concluding paragraph from your article, because I think it's, it's beautiful, and then maybe just invite any, any final thoughts that you would have on, on Paul and, and this particular project that you worked on. So this, this is the final paragraph. 
With these words, Paul leaves his modern-day readers with a valuable archetype of discipleship. Over two, possibly three decades of missionary work, Paul made no shortage of enemies, parted ways with friends and colleagues, wrote epistles, uh, fiery Galatians, and contemplative uh, Philippians, and yet through it all he endured because of his faith. Paul's experiences tell us that the life of a disciple is not an easy one. It requires sacrifice and patience, centered on the conviction that faith in Jesus Christ has not been misplaced or found wanting. As Paul rather explicitly writes to the Philippians, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Paul's legacy comes through to help his readers understand that life is hard and takes its toll, that true commitment can lead to a shortage of earthly satisfaction, and that obtaining a crown of righteousness is not about perfection, but about perseverance. What a, what a beautiful concluding paragraph there. Any final thoughts that, that you would share um, as we wrap this interview up? Yeah, I agree with everything I said there. That's, it was well said, I told yeah, you. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> um, no, just, that's, again, that's one of the things I like about Paul is he's a relatable guy. He is, he's, he, he can look back over his life of persecuting Christians, right, of beating them, perhaps even killing them. In the case of Stephen, absolutely killing them. Um, you know, he's fiery. He yells. Uh, he's ang- gets angry at people, holds grudges against people like Mark, right? Gets frustrated. I mean, every day it seems like he's just so topsy-turvy with Paul. He can kind of run the gamut of emotions and feelings. Yet at the end of the day, when he looks back at contemplates his life, he's like, I'm in. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for me in heaven, right? I mean, I don't... He, he's not the kind of guy who is going to be hung up over little mistakes he may have made. He's not going to get anxious over kind of the day-to-day things. What he looks at is and says, I'm crucified with Christ, right? I I got up on the cross, and I, I crucified my natural self, and I aligned with Jesus. And through his grace, I'm saved. And as long as that relationship is intact, I mean, there's this phrase Paul loves, in Christ, yeah. right? Just two words, but in Christ. It's always using in Christ. Christ liveth in me. Christ I'm liveth in, in Christ. me. Yeah. As long as that relationship exists, as long as I maintain that connection with Jesus, I can be human. I can make mistakes. But guess what? I'm just fine, even though I'm human. And, that's, and there's a nice lesson in that for all of us. Paul would be the first guy to say, you don't have to be perfect. Take it easy on yourself, right? Stop, stop punishing yourself for not being perfect today because no one is just be yourself remember who your savior is and you're going to be just fine if you're interested in reading professor frederick's article quote the life of the apostle paul an overview end of quote it is found in the edited volume the new testament history culture and society a background of the text of the new testament edited by lincoln blumel We have included a link to that book on whyreligion.byu.edu. And remember that if you want to connect with us at Why Religion, comment and give some insights on episodes you've listened to, and see some behind-the-scenes photos and get bonus material, give us a follow on Instagram at whyreligionpodcast. Okay, we've arrived at our last segment of Why Religion, part three, where we like to talk with a professor a little bit more personally about why they chose to be a religious educator, where they got their own education, and why they choose faith. So we wrap up this episode with Nick Frederick sharing a little bit about his academic and faith journey. For the last part of our section, uh, the the last section of this interview, uh, we want to talk about you, your experience, um, and just have a a few questions that that, uh, hopefully you're willing to answer here. So uh, first of all, what is your PhD in, and, and why did you just why did you decide to study that? Uh, so I have to back up a little bit. Um, I was an accounting major when I. So you do remember life before I, I a PhD? Do, I do. Okay. I, I was your typical Mormon kid growing up in small town Utah. I mean, went to seminary, went to church, Eagle Scout, you know, teachers' quorum president, all that stuff. And so when I went to, I started off at Rick's, back when it was Rick's, that's dating myself, right? But I wanted to go to just a small junior college. My parents had gone there. I thought it would be a nice place to get started. I was an accounting major. And while I was there, I I took a couple classes on, you know, philosophic thought, religious history, things like that. And it really opened my eyes to, to realize that church could be more than a kind of a passive experience, right? I'd gone to seminary, but I'd been told what to believe. I'd been told how to read the scriptures. 
now I realized I could do that kind of more actively. And so I went on my mission, came back from my mission, and went to BYU. I was a classicist. I wanted to understand the ancient world in its own setting. I wanted to read the New Testament in Greek and the Old Testament in Hebrew. So I got my BA and MA both here in classics, and I taught adjunct over in classics, and I asked about the possibility of teaching a religion class here while I was doing my master's degree. And um, fortunately, I was able to. And so I taught for three years as an adjunct here until the department chair came to me and said, look, at some point you're going to have to get a PhD or we're going to have to let you go. So I said, fine, and thought, where's a place I could go that would kind of merge my interests in the ancient world and in kind of modern, you know, Latter-day Saint thought and scripture and things like that. And I was fortunate enough to, to go to Claremont Graduate University in California and study with Richard Bushman and kind of develop some of those, um, be able to work in the ancient world, but be able to work with kind of see how that interacts with kind of the modern Latter-day Saint faith, tradition, theology, scripture, things like that. And so that that was life-changing for me. And I was able to come back to BYU and get a job here, and yeah, that's where I am now. So what made you decide then to come be a religion professor at BYU? Was it your experience adjuncting, getting kind of a taste of it there? or? Yeah, I mean, I, I loved teaching. I loved teaching in classics. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but there's something about teaching religion, something about this kind of shared interest. I could teach the Iliad or the Odyssey, and I love it, but my students really don't have anything invested in Homer, right, unless they're a classic student already. When you when you teach a religion class, you're talking to people who are as invested in what you're teaching as you are, right? You can talk about the Book of Mormon. You can talk about the New Testament, um, you can you can share these stories, and you you come from a, a common background with common beliefs and understandings, and it, it's it's a really fun dialogue to have. And I find that I grow and learn from what my students have to offer me the comments they make in class, the perspectives they bring. You know, I I learn as much from them or more than what I myself may pass on to them. And so, for someone like me who wants to keep, you know, who enjoys learning, who enjoys studying, who enjoys kind of writing about Scripture and teasing out different implications of, you know, what Paul might be talking about or what Jesus means by this verse or what Nephi is doing in this particular chapter, right? I, I love kind of untying those questions. There's there's nothing, nothing better than a place like BYU Religious Education. Yeah. As a scholar of ancient scripture, you tackle some often difficult scriptural and religious terrain. Uh, in a world that's moving more and more towards secularism, why do you choose to believe in the restored gospel? What is it uh, that, that informs your faith as a believing scholar? That's a, that's a, that's a, a bit of a weird question for me, just because I don't necessarily... It's hard for me to differentiate between those two, between, you know, faith and scholarship and things like that. Um, I was hired to, with the, the task of taking the Book of Mormon into the academy, right? There had been a lot of great work done on the Book of Mormon by, you know, kind of inside, you know, uh, scholars, those writing for other Latter-day Saints. And my department chair said, I want to see if you can take the Book of Mormon outside. And so that put me in, in a weird position because I was writing about a book that I absolutely believed in, that I loved, but I was trying to talk about it in ways that outside scholars, those who didn't share my faith, could still somehow benefit from that, right? Could still somehow come to a greater understanding of that. And so for me, the lines get a little bit blurred. It's hard for me to, to distinguish between faith and scholarship just because of the way I write and the things I choose to write about. But um, what it, I guess at the end of the day, what it comes down to is you know, is, is the Book of Mormon. I mean, I'm, I'm a Latter-day Saint because of the Book of Mormon, uh, because of, of what it represents, right? This uh, study of continuing prophecy and revelation, and because it's of how, it, how it's Scripture written by people thousands of years ago that, that speak to me today in a way that Paul speaks to me. Right, in a way that the, the book of Revelation and John can speak to me, right? There's I feel like I'm I'm in this constant dialogue with Nephi, with Alma, with Mosiah, right? That they're talking to me and I'm interrogating them, and that it isn't this it, it isn't reaching into the past, right? It's just this this ongoing kind of, of communication. And to me, I find that absolutely riveting. <laughs> 
right? I, I love just picking up the Book of Mormon and opening it up to to a, f- a few verses and just chewing on them for a couple of days. What what is this individual saying? What is you know, what am I supposed to get from this? What's what's a way I've never thought about reading this before, right? And so the Book of Mormon is is truly what what drives me. If if I could spend the rest of my career writing on the Book of Mormon, teaching Book of Mormon, I would be as as happy as could be. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hey, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was created by the fabulous BOU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.